Good morning. This morning we're going to be uh, continuing our study in, in uh, Romans from chapter 1 uh, through chapter 3, verse 20. Romans has spoke directly and quite frankly into the issues of human sin and responsibility. And the outlook for mankind has, has been well, it's been fairly bleak through these, through these chapters. There's a definite chill in the air between God and mankind. The prospects for mankind's future were looking more negative and getting more and more dark with each, each word from the writer's pen. And the only real exception to the darkness was in chapter 1, verse 17. That was the verse that Jim ended with and the one that Chris started with a few weeks ago. And it reads, For in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteousness, the righteous will live by faith. It was the one glimpse in two and a half chapters of a real hope for mankind, but there's a marked change that occurs here in verses 21 to 31, and for the first time in Romans, we're given a real hope for daylight and not just a, a release from eternal darkness, but the expectation of a, a bright and spiritually sunny day. Here in the last half of chapter 3, we're given a, a full breath of, of hope, a completely stunning view of, of the difference, differences that are here and now through Christ Jesus. We're told about the arrival of light into a dark world. Well, sin had left us estranged and and separated from God and condemned to death, we're told that grace is about to change all that. And here in these verses, we can fully enjoy the warmth of light, the, the warmth of God's love and grace that has come into a world that was darkened, but has come into that world through Christ, this light. In studying for this morning, I came across a, a story I'd like to share with you. It's a story about a, an author of of one of our most beloved hymns. It says, back in the 18th century, a young boy was born into a Christian home. For the first six years of his life, he heard the truths of the gospel and he was loved. But sadly, though his parents died, the orphaned boy went to live with his relatives. And there he was mistreated and abused and ridiculed for his faith in Christ. The boy couldn't tolerate that situation and he fled and joined the Royal Navy. In the Navy, the boy's life went downhill. He became known as a brawler and was punished by whipping many times. Finally, while he was still young, he deserted the Royal Navy and fled to Africa, where he attached himself to a Portuguese slave trader, and there his life reached its lowest point. There were times when he actually ate off the floor on his hands and knees. He escaped and then became attached to another slave trader as the first mate on this ship, but the young man's pattern of life had become so depraved he couldn't stay out of trouble. As the story goes, he stole the ship's whiskey and he got so drunk that he fell overboard. He was close to drowning when one of his shipmates harpooned him and brought him back on board. And as a result, the young man had a huge scar on his side for the rest of his life. Doesn't sound like much fun to me. After that, he couldn't get much lower, and in the midst of a great storm off the coast of Scotland, when days and days were filled with pumping water trying to keep the boat afloat, the young man began to reflect on the scripture verses he had heard as a child, and he prayed to God for mercy and was marvelously converted. He later became an Anglican priest and wrote some 280 hymns. The new life John Newton found is reflected in his own heartfelt words, written in 1772, Words familiar to millions now. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. So John Noon's experience, he put into words, or kind of the point of Romans 3, 21 to 31. So let's go ahead and read that. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the challenges that you put before us day by day. They help to make us stronger. And we thank you for the, the blessings and the opportunities that are there. Give us, give us the strength and the wisdom to, to, uh, to use those as opportunities to, to, to spread the, uh, the gospel message that you've placed in our hearts. And we thank you for the grace and mercies that you provide and, and the grant to us through your word. In Jesus' name. So for the first two and a half chapters of Romans, Paul has been laying out bad news and news resulting from a hopelessly wicked state that's hopeless apart from the power of the gospel to transform us. Up to this point in Romans, the, the wrath and the judgment of God has been portrayed as, a, as kind of a crushing burden. And Paul has gone to great lengths to paint us a picture of how we fully deserved the wrath of God. But right here in today's passage, starting with verse 21 of chapter 3, Paul turns the corner and paints for us another picture. But this time it's a picture that, that should bring a smile to our face, one that we can take joy in. We can see that there, there is an alternative to God's wrath crushing us. In this new picture, we see the righteousness of God shown in the gospel message. And it's a, a gospel which contains his sovereign plan to justify men by faith alone. And that plan made possible only through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Paul unfolds this, this plan and, and shows the audience in Rome through many of the Old Testament teachings that this isn't new doctrine at all. In fact, it's exactly what the law and the prophets have been teaching all along. It's a, an especially important message for the Christian Jews to hear and understand. In verse 25, we read that Jesus was put forward as a redemption by his blood. This is also a really significant point as, as Paul communicates the nullification of the, of the old sacrificial system that we read about in Leviticus, known as the Day of Atonement. This Jewish sacrificial system was incredibly involved. It was specific and quite messy, to be honest. Every year the high priest was allowed into the most holy place in order to make atonement for the sins of the entire nation of Israel. Israel would publicly confess their sins to the priest and the priest would take three animals for the sin sacrifices, one bull for himself and his household and two goats for the nation of Israel. After sacrificing the bull for himself and his household, the priest would then sacrifice the first of the two goats. The first goat would be slaughtered to represent God forgiving Israel's sin. And the second goat would have all the sins of Israel confessed over it as the high priest placed both hands on the head of the goat. And the goat would then be sent out into the desert to represent God removing Israel's guilt. And these details are kind of the dominant point to the language of, that Paul is using here in Romans because 
What Paul is saying is that Jesus' death replaced this system of blood sacrifice once and for all. Our sins can now be forgiven and our guilt removed solely through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Hebrews chapter 1 also confirms this truth by saying that Jesus sat down. The, the constant work of the priest offering sacrifices is in sharp contrast with the complete and final work that Jesus accomplished through his death. Next part of that same verse says he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, the place that Jesus sat down happens to be the highest place of authority and honor, indicating again that his, his work was not only complete and final, but it was also perfect. And this is great news that Paul is sharing because of God's righteousness, we have the opportunity to receive by faith the work of Christ in our life. Through the work of Christ, we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the removal of, of guilt and, and shame. I know that I still struggle with some of the stuff that I and my friends were involved in in my younger years. It still takes effort for me to step over or get past the blockades that were passed, placed in my path by Satan. Chris called it a, a swamp of sin a few weeks ago. And I love the visual of that point because I think Satan would love us to sink into the swamp of sin that he has prepared for us. So ask yourself, do you still struggle with guilt or shame for past sins in your life? You should think about those areas of your life where through or because of the completed perfect work of Christ that you can put those things to rest. Put them away. Think about those things that still trouble you and then turn them over and accept or embrace the pardon, the redemption that has been fully paid by Christ. What was accomplished through Christ should lead us to worship freely and openly and should lead us to thoroughly examine our lives, the lives that we can, we can filter through this, the light of, of the truth of this, of this gospel message. And if this is true, and Jesus has removed all the barriers between himself and us, then ask, are we fully embracing the relationship we can now have with Jesus by hanging on to the, to the guilt and the shame of past sins? We should learn from our mistakes and sins, but at the same time, we should fully embrace the fact that Christ has redeemed us from the hell that we were destined for told in Psalm 103, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This truth should also humble us because apart from Christ, there's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing any of us can do to gain a right standing before God. Starting in verse 25, we're told that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now this is really kind of the heart of the gospel message and the basis of, of, and foundation really for assurance. And many people, even though they become Christians, struggle with assurance. They don't rest on the fact that these words are true and they're, they're filled too often with struggles of doubt and uncertainty and that may be a sneaking suspicion that deep inside, perhaps despite all these wonderful words, God is still not quite satisfied and that if something were to happen to them, they might be lost and condemned. But do you see clearly what's being offered here? We've been offered atonement and a full pardon for all our sins. And it's a righteous pardon. It's a, a pardon done to fully and completely justify those who have faith. And that as children of God, we can be free of the sins that separated us from God our Heavenly Father. And to receive this atonement, this pardon, 
The only requirement is faith in Jesus, God's Son, our Savior and Redeemer. This is truly an amazing gift. But understanding man's propensity to, to take credit and boast, in the last few verses of this section, Paul tells us that there's, there's no room for boasting or taking credit in anything that we do on our own in this personal quest for righteousness. Starting at verse 27, it says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yeah, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? No, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. The Jews were worried that Jesus would nullify the law and all their customs and, and traditions and everything that they stood for. But here Paul explains that it actually, actually confirms their religion and, and shows how the, the way of salvation is tied directly to faith which in turn helps them understand how the gospel message is, is actually tied to the law of God and also tied to many of their Jewish customs and traditions. We're told in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. That's an amazing statement in and of itself. <laughs> we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I'd like to back up and go to the, the beginning of this passage for a moment. It says, Paul starts out with the words, but now. And you can almost hear the expression of relief in those two words. After God was given, has given his appraisal of man's failed efforts to achieve some good standing before him, now comes words of relief. God's total and complete answer to man's complete and total failure. God gave his description of, of what humanity is like as, as God sees it. He talks about God's ability to see everything about us. Nothing is hidden from his eyes. Not our thoughts, our hearts, our intentions, or our motives. We saw last week that there's clearly no one who can make it in God's sight. Job shared with us words from chapter 3 that tell us, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who searches for God. All have turned away and together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. That's God's appraisal. And then Paul says those two words. But now. But now, a righteous, righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This is God's gracious nevertheless in the face of man's failure. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This is what Paul calls in, in 1 Timothy the glorious gospel of the blessed God. This is really good news that God has announced to us through Paul. It's good news which includes a, a gift that God gives us. And what is that gift? It's, it's the righteousness of God himself. I'm going to read that this word righteousness is often misunderstood in our day. It's usually associated with behavior. If somebody is behaving in a right way, we, we say that they're behaving righteously. But, but here in the book of Romans, righteousness is not directly touch on behavior. Here it's not what you do, it's what you are. And that's important because your behavior stems from what you are, what you truly believe. The gift Paul is talking about, this gift from God, is a righteous standing. Listen to verses 22 to 24. It says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified 
freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul wanted to make it very clear that this righteousness was available to all. He said it three times. But also that this righteousness is apart from the law. This is not something that you, that you earn. It's a gift. You cannot earn it by doing your best to be pleasing to God. And anybody who approaches God on those terms has, has already failed. There's no way anyone can measure up to God's standards. It doesn't matter how sweet or how humble they are because God knows their heart. But nevertheless, God has provided a way to grant us the gift of righteousness apart from the law. A righteousness that we, we could not and cannot earn. Paul also says that this righteousness has been testified to by the law and the prophets. So this is not something entirely new in history, but something that only Jesus Christ could truly bring to light. Christ fully revealed things that were only expressed by the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. And because of his coming, we could understand more clearly the love and grace and mercy of God. What God is offering is a gift of righteousness. His own perfect righteousness. And it's a, a righteousness that can't be improved upon. It's a true and, and perfect value. By faith in Jesus Christ, he gives us a sense of, of righteous worth. Worth and acceptance. And there really could be no better news to mankind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these words are so remarkable we can hardly believe them. In fact, our hearts, sometimes we still struggle with them at times. But this is uh, clearly what your word says, and we, we thank you for that. I pray that we may live our lives reflecting on, on your example, that we can be forgiving to each other be tender-hearted and loving towards one another. Through Christ Jesus, we've already been given those gifts ourselves. And Lord, you truly know what's in our hearts. We thank you for the knowledge and assurance that our salvation will be accomplished just as your words declared it. Lord, as we prepare for uh, communion this morning just share the cup and the, the bread together that we would take a moment and and uh, examine our hearts and uh, give those things that we struggle with to you that uh, we can have freedom from all of that and uh, you provided it you've loved us and you will love us for an eternity we thank you for that knowledge in Jesus' name, amen.